Um, today we're joined by um, Richard Sharp and Tammy Kitajima, both instructors for our supply chain and risk management course, as well as our managing director for the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute, Chris Gaffney. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Chris, thanks. Andy, thank you very much and welcome Richard and Tammy, thank you for joining as well. Looking forward to a nice discussion today on an important topic. Um, and so we're gonna talk about supply chain risk management and we're gonna talk specifically about how the course that we offer and have um, on the calendar upcoming um, is a great way for those who see this topic as an important topic for they individually and or their company. So we, um, we look forward to any feedback and we also look forward um, to hopefully learning a little bit. So um, with that, um, if you'll go ahead and advance the slide, Andy, you know, this course is part of our overall lifelong learning, professional education, executive education offering uh, from the Georgia Tech Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. Uh, this is one of our three pillars of our focus for our ecosystem, along with the research we do and the industry partnership work we do. And, you know, as an interdisciplinary research center, our uh, course offering, both what we offer, what's included, how we deliver it, is heavily informed by what we do in our academic research and in our academic teaching for our undergraduate and graduate students. So we're, we are constantly calibrating what is a hot topic, what is impactful in industry, and both the courses. Um, we're, we just finished a validation of our course offering, and we're doing some modification, and, and that's definitely what we've done in the space of this course. So um, we're looking forward uh, to this class and delivering of this class. We've had a, a couple of nice classes that have come through this week um, with very nice attendance and very nice feedback, and, and we're hoping um, our effort today leads more people to choose to take this class. So um, I'd love for Richard and Tammy to introduce themselves as well, uh, as they've been partners with us for many years. Thank you, Chris. Um, certainly, we appreciate everyone attending today, um, and we're very appreciative of our relationship with Georgia Tech and the Supply Chain Logistics Institute. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful relationship for many years, as you said, Chris. Uh, I'm Richard Sharp. I'm the CEO of Competitive Insights. Uh, Tammy, would you like to say hello? Yes. Hi, I'm Tammy Kitajima, and I'm a senior manager at Competitive Insights and been working with Richard and in the space really for over 10 years now. And Competitive Insights, uh, just as a very brief uh, introduction, uh, we've been in existence uh, for well over 25 years. We are a AI solutions provider, and our focus is to pro provide end-to-end -end visibility of performance for supply chains focused on very key initiatives and using information that is very specific and very trusted. And today, we're going to talk about supply chain risk and innov innovative ways to look at supply chain risk using information that you trust and that is very specific for every aspect of your supply chain. So let's advance the slide, please. Chris, you want to say anything about, you know, the history of risk or should I jump in here? Nope. I would love to comment on what we see and, you know, historically in my industry experience, you know, supply chain risk for many companies was not a priority. For some large companies, it was. Uh, but you could generally say, as I experienced in the 2000s, there were periods of time where the perceived risk for supply chains was low. And I think many people would say we were kind of lulled into um, a, a sense of complacency there because out of sight, out of mind. That shifted a lot. And what I would say today is the risks are, you know, are acute. And the people that I've worked with in industry and the people that we work with at Georgia Tech are now constantly on guard about their risk to their supply base. The world has shifted 
a bit. And I know Richard will go into depth into that. But the reality is, I think more and more, we're just not going to have these times where things are quiet. The risks come, you know, if not every week, every month. Um, but we have to really be concerned about our overall understanding of our supplier risk. It's definitely been exacerbated by a shift in the geopolitical arena, a lot going on out there that doesn't appear to um, be going to abate. You know, we now have um, two large wars that, you know, are getting publicity, um, many smaller ones that aren't, depending on where you source, those things have a greater or lesser effect. We now also have obviously larger trade challenges emerging and existing challenges with between the US and China. We still have an unstable situation post-Brexit in Europe. So the whole geopolitical piece is real. Um, we've had very acute challenges in logistics with issues with the Panama Canal, uh, with the Red Sea, with the Suez Canal, and those do not appear to be abating. Um, Cyber has become an all company risk, big or small. You can be put out of business by a cyber issue. And, you know, the, the people that play in that space are increasingly adept at going after smaller companies, going after suppliers to large companies. So a very real set of dynamics. And I think, you know, for us, um, financial risk has become a bigger deal as the interest rate market has gone from very benign to very challenging over the last few years. We hope that's going to come down. And then obviously from an operational standpoint, availability of employees, um, performance of equipment seems to be rising as a concern. And then finally, the overall environmental risk is out there. So you can pick what you want, but this is a topic that in our mind um, is becoming something that has to be an all skate and on focus. And I think the reality is a lot of companies are still struggling with how to get good at this. And this is where I think what we're gonna talk about today is relevant. There are a lot of typical strategies in terms of how you assess this risk and mitigate it. But I think we feel like there's more work to be done. And we think that's a, a, a prime motivator for folks interested in this, in this class. So Richard, that's my, opening for you on this this end of the well, topic. Chris, you're exactly right. We're, what we're looking at here is a study done this year uh, by McKinsey. Uh, and as you can see across the board, people are aware of the risk. Certainly after COVID, they took a, a lot more interest in it and began to think about programs to mitigate it, as Chris just said. But the reality of it is, is cost pressures and other uh, operational pressures have uh, position companies to be focusing on other things. And unfortunately, supply chain risk somewhat takes a back seat until the next disruption. And what this class is all about is how to get ahead of that. So a lot of, of uh, uh, very good risk programs out there from a variety of different uh, solutions and vendors focus on the actual operational risk. So how do we address disruptions in the flow of a supply chain in order that we can continue to run our business and service our customers. And that is a great topic to be focused on, but this class is different. What we're gonna talk about in this class is how to be able to focus on ways to not just look at every possible way that your disruption could occur, but how do we prioritize those? How do we think about where we are going to apply limited resources in order to be able to make the organization more resilient uh, and be able to handle disruptions that you may anticipate or disruptions that you may not anticipate. And as Chris said, there, there are lots of ways to think about this, but as you're thinking about uh, the structure and the way you're communicating internally about risk, we in the class support a common language so that you can actually have you know, a cross-functional discussion and everyone is on the same page as to what you're talking about and how you're planning to be able to add resiliency. So the sources of risk in, in the class that we offer are centering around commercial risk. Uh, Chris just mentioned that on financial, but there are a number of IT and other related commercial risk. 
looking at geopolitical risk, uh, as Chris also said, uh, that's a very big part of today's operational world. And then thinking about the one everybody addresses when they think about risk, and that's a physical risk, a tsunami, a hurricane, things that actually disrupt the ability for your supply chain to actually operate. So in moving from the operational disruptions to more of a, a proactive and reactive approach, which Tammy is going to cover in more detail, there are ways to be able to structure your mitigation strategies. And the one that most people think about, and, and is co a correct way to approach it, is redundancy. So think about your supply chains, or think about your data centers. You have repetitive or duplicate uh, processing abilities in case something goes out, you have the immediate opportunity to switch over to a new, new data center. So redundancy, but it tends to be the most expensive way to add resiliency. But then you can have contingency, and contingency is all around knowing what to do if something happens and having your people be well-informed and trained and saying, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. And that is, is certainly a very good way to think about that. And you want to fashion the right mitigation strategy to the right problem, of course. And the last one, which people usually don't take mo much advantage of, is policy. How can you change your policies in order to add resiliency? So we're going to be very focused on targeting very specific actions uh, where it could hurt the most in your supply chain and what to do about it. So Chris, just adding on a little bit, if we can just use an example, uh, Andy, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, this slide is just, well, well, this is just a recap of what I just said. So let's move on to the next one. So this is a, a visualization of, of what we're uh, basically offering in the class as a simple example. So what we have is a view of suppliers. And these are suppliers that are for a company that are obviously dispersed all over the world. And basically the size of the dots that you see here are representing for a supplier how much of the products that they're providing you to sell are actually uh, profitable. So the larger the, the bubble, the more profitable products are coming from that supplier. The color coding represents the amount of risk associated with that geographical area. So if you can see that big uh, orange dot right over uh, to the right of the, of the map, that is basically telling us that that supplier is providing a lot of profitable product, but it is in a very high risk area. So why does that matter? Well, if you've got you know, hundreds of thousands of products being made by vendors all over the world, where do your procurement resources focus in order to mitigate risk? Well, clearly you're gonna focus on the areas where the suppliers that are giving you the most profit are able to, you're able to work with them and think about the right mitigation strategy to minimize the impact if something was to happen in that location with that supplier. So it's all focused on zeroing in on the things that would hurt the most and being able to take both proactive and reactive strategies in order to handle that, which Tammy will cover in more detail. All right, let's keep going. Chris? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that we we highlight, and Richard commented on this, um, we've taken very intentional steps to enhance, um, frankly, all of our classes based on you know, our reflection of what tools are increasingly available and what areas are of greater priority. And a lot of what we've done for our classes has been informed by our work with Georgia AIM, which is part of a global or national grant um, to really improve uh, capabilities in running supply chains. And the big focus of Georgia AIM is to be able to bring artificial intelligence, more advanced analytics, um, closer uh, to application and more accessible to application with the very clear intent to improve supply chain resilience and effectiveness. So this class is kind of right in the center of the bullseye um, and Richard and Tammy and the team have worked to enhance the offering over the last year or two based on our work with Georgia AIM. And I think, you know, the connection that 
I make to this. You know, this course is part of one of our overall certificates, and it, it is part of our supply and demand planning certificate. So if you're interested in this single class, this may be a motivation for you to look at the broader certificate, but the overall space in supply and demand planning to me is the best place to bring the resilience discussion into the table. If you're working on a sales and operations planning kind of process and discipline, and even a more enhanced integrated business planning, um, kind of culture at your company. This is another reason why the course may be the right thing to do. And in, 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 in frankly, the way we uniquely focus on it, getting the right level of priority attention. You saw on the McKinsey slide, it's very easy for the senior folks in an organization to say, things have quieted down, let's reduce our focus on risk management and supply chain resilience. But the way we prioritize and highlight the risk with a context of product and customer profitability is a great way to bring this topic into the ongoing discussion around sales and operations planning and integrated business planning, because the people around that table who are not supply chain people um, are finance people, they're sales and marketing, they're commercial people, and they're senior management who are interested in profitability. And if we can connect the dot between a supplier risk to profitability, we have a much greater probability of getting those people to the table to say, this is clearly an issue. What are we doing about it? What resources are we bringing to it? So I think our unique approach to this really positions people who are you know, in that place in their organization where they're trying to kind of beat the drum for this to be much better equipped to get the right focus and commitment to action. I couldn't, Richard, that is exactly right, Chris. I mean, it is all about for commercial organizations, where are we at risk for being able to serve our customers and prioritize our resources to protect the profitability of the operation while servicing our customers? I couldn't agree with you more. I think, Tammy, you have a little bit more to say about that, right? Yeah, we just finished a project with the company and provided these type of insights um, similar around profitability and finding just opportunities for generating profit, but uh, we could obviously do that for protecting profit too. I mean, it's, it's a similar conversation and we were able to do this for this company and they're even wanting more insights um, more opportunities from, from all the analytics. I mean, we uh, employed AI ML technology and it just resulted in a lot of eye-opening uh, results around their products and customers. And so, yeah, with risk too, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you're missing, right? right. You, it's those kind of the hidden ones that you don't think about that can um, kind of crawl up on you later that keeps you up at night, right? So, um, you know, and when you have such that visibility- was done under Georgia AIM, right? Yep, yeah. It was a great project under Georgia AIM and um, yeah, we were able to knock it out in a in a short period of time for this, such an end-to-end visibility um, of profitability. Excellent. All right, let's move on. Tammy? All right. Yeah. So, you know, we've all been kind of talking about it. So, you know, with the supply chain disruptions and great examples of current ones um, that Chris mentioned, there's such a world of, you know, so many kinds of risks and, and it could be very overwhelming. Richard and I, we actually took part in creating a standard operating document with a bunch of industry leaders and we came up with a list and it ended up being like five pages, hundreds of risks. So there's so many, and also they're always changing. So I think that's where the AI helps in identifying where our vulnerabilities are. And obviously for most, for most companies now, once a supply chain disruption happens, it's into reactive mode. What do we do next? You know, if it's like your house is on fire, we got to put out the fire first, right? So it's that immediate crisis management response. And then there's a recovery after that of how do we get back to a normal, 
right now. So how do we get back to a normal state? And obviously with COVID, there's talks about we're not even there yet, right? So sometimes the bigger the disruption, the longer it takes. Yeah, smaller ones, hopefully you could jump back um, into regular operating mode, but there's definitely financial impact even during that period because of that operational break, um, you know, all of the resources, time to get back to that normal. But there is also the proactive side. And we actually emphasize this a lot. And um, a lot of risk doesn't really emphasize, emphasize this section enough that you want to be prepared. You know, you want to minimize the possible impact of a disruption. So, you know, we have the strategies that Richard just mentioned, policy, all those that can help minimize that impact because with disruptions like COVID and, you know, any kind of like obviously geopolitical, what can you do to prevent that? Not much. It's almost like it's bound to happen. How do you, how do you stop that? But it's not about how do you stop that? It's how do you prevent it from impacting your operation, your supply chain operation, and hence the profitability impact too. So we cover all of this, which is quite a bit of content, as you can imagine, but that's where we use AI technology to emphasize where can it help that this is not such a big task and have to be done obviously because of changing risk, that it doesn't have to be done regularly. It could actually be done with your regular uh, real-time data, you know, that you get that, um, so it doesn't have to be such an effort, a one-time effort and a, you know, a binder that you do and put it on the shelf, right? So um, this is where we cover a lot of this in the class. And we talk about, again, the prioritization of risks and then the strategies in these two areas here. And uh, Andy, next please. So uh, we covered that in the class. And as you can imagine, there, there's a lot of change management aspects and also cross-functional discussion requirements. And with that, that goes along with our exercises that we do throughout the course of, of the class so that we teach the material, but this gives them a chance, uh, the participants, a chance to really think through it, right? And apply it to a to an exercise, you know, a sample company. And really, um, you know, a lot of them actually take their backgrounds from their own companies and integrate it into the exercises too. And so a lot of our exercises, the teams, they have a great time meeting new people, people from different backgrounds. We've had folks from the public sector, government side, obviously commercial side, and all their experiences in the different industries because there's so many different risks across industries. And in these exercises, by the end, our final exercise is actually them kind of just going through the entire supply chain risk process. They're comfortable talking about all the, the uh, risks that they identify, the strategies, and uh, and how to monitor those strategies. And we like to have fun, and we like to throw in a little surprise here and there that, hey, we just got a new risk that just happened. So how would you adapt to that? And yeah, sometimes we get folks that groan and like, oh, no, yeah, that's just completely ruined our plans. But they're comfortable in talking about it and and how to respond to it so i think we have a lot of fun richard yep. um yeah um and, they and, yeah and create powerpoints and all they're presenting to each other so tammy sets it up so that each team has spent a day and a half working through you know here's our strategy with information that we typically would have within our company now we give them better information using ai and, oh, wow, now that I know that, I would adjust these things. And then the final is they have all the information they need. They're comfortable. They're ready to present to the board of directors, which is the rest of the class. And then Tammy throws this ringer in it, and they go, they're like, oh, you know, we were all done. We were comfortable. And as Tammy said, 
Now we've got to redo, but that's the whole purpose of this, to be able to walk back into their companies and be able to communicate in ways that make sense to be able to get the company to say, hey, this is a new way of thinking about it. Uh, it's prioritized. It's uh, specific. And, you know, we need to take a new look at how we're thinking about resiliency. So you're absolutely right, Tammy. And, and it's always fun to watch the teams do that. Yeah. And if anything, they at the end, they feel comfortable talking about it. So we do have an exercise of how would you apply this in your own company? And they all have their ideas and, and, and some of them share it and all. And, you know, it's sometimes just starting the conversation in a strategic level, right? You know, it's so common that we're talking about cutting costs, becoming more lean and all that, but that actually causes a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in the supply chain. So it's just kind of giving them at least the, the consideration when, uh, when talking about those strategies that, okay, we could go leaner, but yeah, that makes us more vulnerable. So um, with the strategic team, with executives and cross-functionally, it's great to have, I mean, a lot of our, our participants are in the supply chain background and around that area, but uh, it's great to hear them talk in these groups with the perspective of finance, of sales. And um, and it makes them think of things that they wouldn't consider to the impact. Yeah. Well, Andy, you you've been involved in some of these classes, listening to the students. Any, do you have anything to add on that? No, I th I think when I've been in there with the breakout rooms, and it's nice having different people from different backgrounds, different industries. There's a lot of insights that people, you know, they just don't looking at a problem from a different perspective is always interesting and in, in hearing people's, um, you know, just examples of what they've had to deal with in the past, you know, things that their C-level executives are concerned about, ways that they're trying to intelligently come up with arguments of like why we need to take risk, supply chain risk more seriously. Because, you know, obviously with COVID, that was a prime example of if you're not prepared that, people are just you're in a difficult position right right and chris i i understand from you know just past the past that people seem to like this class right from the ratings and uh it, you know they come back saying you know this is something we can take back into the company um so i think i think it's uh it's a good uh add-on to the certificate that chris mentioned for georgia tech uh, we're just very proud to be a part of it, that's for sure. And the class the class seems to go well. Yeah, I mean, all of our classes have kind of a post-completion survey process, and we score them. That's part of how we prioritize the courses that we're going to continue to offer, where we put emphasis. And to Richard's point, we, can, we have consistent high scores from the folks who've attended this class. So I think we're very confident that if you make the commitment to attend, you'll get things, you'll learn but you'll get things that you can take back and apply in your everyday work. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we've got one more slide, I think, um, just to kind of do a wrap up. And Chris, please jump in here. Uh, I'll start, but you know, again, people are uh, correctly uh, thinking about how to handle resiliency, how to make their organization more bulletproof, if you will, with regard to uh, disruptions. I mean, just the ones that Chris opened up with, those are disruptions today. What will be the disruptions in 2025, 2026? And it's really hard to kind of look at that and think about, well, we can't boil, you know, we can't go in and find what's causing this across the entire landscape of our supply chain or boil the ocean, if you will, and trying to find that. So the bottom line is that this class takes that whole process and turns it around to we're not gonna to try to do that. We're gonna to try to look at where we're vulnerable that will impact our ability to service customers and our ability to continue to have the organization be profitable. So as we all know, for a commercial organization, the, the left side of the scale, focusing on generation of profit is absolutely, you know, a, a very uh, important criteria in order to be able to have a healthy organization. 
This class is saying we aren't taking away from that at all, but we're going to balance the strategies, the policies that we're implementing to help protect our ability to do that by pinpointing specific areas that would have the biggest impact on our ability to serve customers and generate profitability. So it's a very, as Chris said, a, a very unique way to think about supply chain risk. Um, and we're very fortunate to be a part of this with Georgia Tech and, and Andy and Chris and the whole great team there at uh, Supply Chain uh, Logistics Institute. So. Yeah, I think I'll I'll close on this slide and then we'll go to the last slide for kind of more info. You know, in my professional world, once I understood this topic, you know, in the context of my core roles, whether I was in logistics or whether I was in supply chain planning or ultimately in supply chain strategy at Coke, you know, my my view was an understanding that this was not necessarily the most popular topic but it was necessary. And so what I was always trying to do was saying, how do I get the right level of focus on this by the people in the organization who needed to be aware and who could influence and inform actions and, and help us make different decisions with better information around what our real risk was. And so I think this class perfectly equipped someone who is in that same boat trying to say, I want to make sure my company does the right thing. Um, I want to be one of those people who can be an agent of change in my organization to get the right level of priority placed on this. So I would encourage you, if you if that's you, then you should strongly consider signing up for the class. So Andy, if you can go forward, um, I'm going to kind of highlight the fact that we've got this course on the calendar about three weeks out from now, Richard and Tammy will be in the mix um, with the students. This will be a virtual class, so you can take it from wherever you are. Um, and if you're interested in signing up, um, you've got the links below. These slides will go out as well as um, you know our standard email address at SCL course at scl.tech.edu. If you are a Georgia resident, let us know. We've got some pretty good discounts to, to get folks into the class. Um, we know this time of the year, um, depending on where you are, if you get support from your company, in many cases, there's good budget money left over to support your career development. So um, we, we have covered everything that we would intend to cover. We're happy if you've got questions to throw them into the the chat um, and we're happy to cover anything that comes up. And Chris, we are offering this on a periodic basis, right? It's not a one-time offering for the class. Yeah, this class, this is our last offer for 24. We'll be publishing the 25 schedule over the next couple of weeks. So it um, it will be in our, in our rotation. Right. Very okay, good. Great. Yeah, thank you, Tammy, Richard, Chris. Again, um, I have a couple of questions. I see that somebody, uh, that some folks had typed in, but if you do have a question, uh, please feel free. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom control panel and you can just type them in there and, and the group will see those. Um, I see Melanie, there, there was one question uh, in a comment. It can be overwhelming to think about all the possible supply chain risks. How do we identify the risks that we should be most concerned about? I'll start. Um, that's a really good question because it is overwhelming. It's daunting to the point where you say, you know, I don't even know where to start, right? So that that's one reason when we were thinking about this class and, and working with, uh, you know, Chris and team, it, it, we realized that we needed a, a, a different way to help answer that question. Uh, again, we think that all of the approaches that are currently out there with regard to, to minimizing operational flow disruptions, transportation management systems, warehouse management systems, point of sale systems, those are all very important as you're thinking about risk and using that data to help with your risk uh, planning. But our, this offering is different. It's not about just, you know, what do we do if there's a disruption? It's really about how do we get ahead of it? And so to answer the question, 
uh, through a process that the class, you know, walks through, we are looking at each area of the supply chain. If you think about your supply chain and where it starts and where it ends, you know, the ability to understand what each asset in that supply chain offers with regard to the operations of moving profitable and unprofitable products so that you can begin to prioritize the assets that you want to protect so that if something did happen, you are in a much better position to be able to handle that disruption with a minimal impact on your customers. And it does get into unprofitable customers and profitable. So as an example, if you're in an allocation mode where you only have a certain amount of product and you know that's coming for the next period of time, you may change the strategy of who's, which orders you're going to service by offering you know, the products to your most profitable customers and for your unprofitable customers going back to them besides other strategies and say, you know, we're sorry, but there may be, you know, a couple of week delay in being able to service your order. But it helps you prioritize the resources in order to be able to be better in reacting to the disruption and in being proactive, as Tammy said, in being able to do things well ahead of anything occurring to be able to minim minimize the impact. So I hope that helps. Yep, and the, I'll, I'll add a couple things again. From my experience, you're right. It can be um, overwhelming. I have always been a fan of kind of the simple Pareto kind of idea and, you know, try to understand using whatever framework that existed. We like what we're talking about here and prioritize. And, you know, to Richard's map, if you could understand what's the number one supplier risk on my list, that's where I would start. And, you know, what that looks like is if I perceive that, and it's probably for me when I think Pareto, at least the top three, then I want to really understand with all of the people who manage the relationship with those top three suppliers, do we understand enough about their business? And in particular, that's where I would first go to understand their suppliers and then be able to get into a much greater both relationship discussion with those suppliers. If they're important to us, we need to be investing correctly. We need to understand, do they value the business that we do with them as much as we value them? Make sure that our management routines with them are more robust. Make sure we have a periodic connection with them so that we're calibrating that risk. And to the extent that that investment um, manifests itself in, in actions that we feel comfortable, then we could go further down the Pareto list. But that's, to me, that's the practical way that I think about it. And, you know, as Richard said, you know, the first thing you do is understand the risk. Then you can get into the actions to be able to um, mitigate that. And, and I think, what goes beyond that is if you can find a way that works, then you could scale that, then you could potentially go further down your supplier landscape to understand that element of your risk. Then you would go across the same, you know, the type of risk that we talked about and make sure you're understanding your top three in each of those. So it's very much a, what I would call kind of chip away at it, if right. you will with a prioritization kind of mindset, which is what the Pareto allows you to do. Right. And using AI to monitor if those strategies are working. So, you know, as, as we've all said, the world changes every day. So every month, you know, how well are we doing on what you just said, Chris? And is there something new we need to worry about with regard to those suppliers that wasn't true yesterday? Yeah, I think that's part of the maturity of it, right? Depends on where you are, right? If you're early in that journey, you're trying to just basically understand that landscape of where the risks are. Right. To Richard's point, once you get going, you've got to use or, or you've got to advocate internally to create the ability to assess that risk on an ongoing basis. Richard referred to that ideal state for us of getting more sophisticated analytics in there, but that may be data coming from our suppliers. That may be 
our investment in additional external sources of data that may help us see that risk earlier. Um, you may choose to do that yourself. You may choose to a partner to work with you on that. So to me, you know, I, I think once I've gotten into the pool on this, understand that risk, start on some mitigation, the real next big step is getting into what I would call kind of an overall risk management roadmap, which will start to get at some of the investments we need to make over time. Then you can get the organization committed to a plan. You don't have to solve everything at once, but get on that journey um, and create the muscle that allows you to do this on a sustaining basis and to get better over time. Absolutely. Yeah. We've also had um, participants in the class that profit is not maybe their main metric that they want to go for. And we have tailored our messaging on that too. So uh, for nonprofits and government, they sometimes think through it by even the simplest is volume. You know, if um, their most important item is coming from, all of it is coming from one source, it's still a similar conversation, right? The mitigation strategy is like, well, maybe you want to have another source, dual source that item. Um, and, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, strategies from that still comes from having visibility. So it is a similar topic. We do, you know, tweak our messaging um, for some folks to make them understand, or even for government folks, you know, to learn about how commercial side works and what their priorities would be and how to um, collaborate too. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of people get a lot um from learning in this class um, from each other too. Okay, great. Uh, we received some other questions. You touched on aspects these a little, but let me let me go ahead and ask uh, just in case. I mean, Ian asked, uh, how do we make supply chain risk an ongoing priority when resources are already scarce? Yep, I, I, I'll comment on that because I was always trying to think about this. This is why I advocate it being part of your planning process. Uh, if you if it's not at all in, in the organization today, most organizations have an annual planning process. And that's where I would work with my procurement teams as they work on their um, supplier relationship management for the following year, looking at existing agreements and new agreements, help them include some ask of, aspect of risk management in their planning process on an annual basis. And if your organization has an ongoing supply and demand planning process, whether you call it sales and operations planning, integrated business planning, or something else, make sure that if you've got zero focus on it today, say, give me 5% five, 5 of the focus. Let's make sure we've got one slide in the deck talking about our understanding of current risks and how that's changed from a prior period of time and start to get some visibility at a senior level. And based on that visibility, say, this is not only our view of risks, this is our view of steps to mitigate and get feedback from that higher level um, stakeholder group to say, do we feel comfortable with our understanding of the risk? Do we feel comfortable that we're taking steps? And are there more steps that we could take? And then if you're in that position to try to get this higher on the list, start to to, to be ready to say, here's what else we would suggest to do so that we can we can get more mature in this space. T to me, that's how I would manage in a world of time priority and money priority. I agree. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah, we had a question about, you know, who's responsible for supply chain risk. I heard you mention like the procurement group, you know, maybe some companies have special teams to do that, but um other than the procurement group, like what what would you comment on that question? Yeah, I mean, I think you know you've got to think of public public company, private company, big company, small company, right? Um, if it's the extreme a public company like Coke, the good news is the board has some level of concern on this, and that that has that's the easy path because you'd likely get more sustaining effort on it because it's something the board has determined to be a priority. That the challenge is when you get to a smaller company, whether it's a privately held company or publicly held, and it's not a current priority. You know, ideally, the reality is the C-level people should should view this as a priority, right? That may or may not be 
practical or pragmatic. For, for me, in my experience, the people, as you click down in the organization who might be more interested in this, in many cases, the finance people were interested because they understood the implications. If we didn't see a risk and weren't able to mitigate it, they, they understand the risk to business, whether that be continuity of supply and or, um, and or increased cost of doing business. Um, for me, beyond that, that's when I was looking for the chief supply chain officer, because those are the folks who understand and probably more motivated from uh, a continuity of supply. A lot of the folks that I saw during COVID who were in chief supply chain roles were able to drive a greater focus on resilience in the organization because they had gaps in supply. And now it's just a matter of making sure that those memories don't fade. But that constituency should be an advocate. And then I think the procurement folks, you know, ideally they would be a champion for this, but they are the ones who have the greatest pressure on cost. And I think for them, it's more a matter of balance. How do you have a balanced view um, to your priorities in your procurement and sourcing strategies to where you're not only focused on best cost, best quality, but also continuity of supply? So to me, those are the different stakeholders I was always working with. I do think your planning folks, as you click further down, they're the ones who, you know, who, who will be good advocates and change advocates for this because they understand the pain of this. Um, so those are those are my thoughts on that. Yeah. I I agree. And I think I think that uh if you think about, you know, we often say in the class, you know, what was if you were if you were uh, sitting in a boardroom or with your SNOP team or whatever, and someone was to say to you, hey, there's going to be a disruption that's literally going to change the world. And it's going to be something that has a significant impact on your business in ways that you can't understand today. And, you know, you say, well, what's the probability of that happening? And, you know, pre-COVID, the answer most likely would have been, I think that's a very low likelihood to have such a massive uh, impact on the world and on my business. And then fast forward to COVID and that's exactly what happened. So building on Chris's point, it's not only the areas that you worry the most about because of probability, it's the things that can have the biggest impact for your business that you may not even see happening. So it, it, it's really that cross-functional uh, focus, as Chris said, and as Chris said, one step at a time, you know, focus it on areas where you're a little more resilient than you were the year before. And uh, it's all about protecting the operation and the uh, servicing of your customers. Yeah. Okay. I think supply chain definitely is obviously um, supply chain executive C-suite level is the obvious, you know, uh, leader, hopefully. But but yeah, I think all all parts of the organization is talking about risk one way or another. You know, as Chris mentioned, you know, with even cyber attack. Right. So um, or even, you know, when you sell out, you know, shelves are empty and people can't sell. You know, then sales are wondering where's the you know um, where's the products and all that. It's it has so many impacts across the the organization, but um, I think yeah, it's falling more on supply chain overall. Of course, right now suppliers is the hot hottest area or maybe the easiest niche to start with, like Chris was mentioning. Um, so there's a lot of technology out there that really focus on procurement specifically, you know, having um, visibility into multiple tiers of suppliers. And there's so much regulation now building up on that um, requirement. So that's definitely a hot area right now, but it should be an end-to-end -end consideration. And therefore, it really should fall on the supply chain exec. Okay, great. Uh this always comes up or it's come up uh, recently in questions, but uh, can you explain in more detail how AI is being used in the supply chain risk management approach? Yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, you know, when you're talking about visibility of where you're at risk, um, there are a lot of ways to do that. Um, and, you know, as Chris said, you know, you want to start 
by peeling the onion one, one slice at a time, one layer at a time. But ultimately, risk, as Tammy said, can occur anywhere in your supply chain. It can be at a port, which we're all watching right now, what's going to happen with a potential strike across you know, the various ports. It can happen with the suppliers, which we've talked a lot about. It can happen with you know, any aspect of the movement of your supply chain uh, in order to run your business. So at where AI for us is, is very applicable is the uh, ability to process the data associated with that end-to-end -end flow. And for most companies, you know, looking at every transaction associated with that flow, you can be talking about 4 billion transactions easily every month. So uh, AI and machine learning are a perfect way to start to get your hands around that to be able to understand what's going on and to be able to process that data in such a way that it's trusted and specific to the questions you're trying to answer. So it's it's really a wonderful application that can have you know direct impact uh, with regard to supply chain risk management. Yeah, when I started with Richard, when we were talking about you know supply chain risk um, management, it a lot of what I heard about um, how it was done was it was an exercise of, okay, here's a risk. Is it probable or not probable? And what's a possible impact to the operation? And it was just in generalized buckets of, okay, it's probable. It could hurt a lot. Very generalized. And therefore, those became priority. And um, I mean, that worked to help focus and prioritize, but I think with AI, it has made the process so much easier and faster and not such a daunting ex exercise to consider all the possible risks and put them in those individual buckets that constantly change. So um, with all the, the data and, and uh, availability, the analytics, it makes that process so much easier, less costly, less time. Um, and, and it, you know, a lot of uh, technology coming out there with simulation and all of that stuff, but, but it's the pinpointing and, and, the, and the prioritization, especially that um, helps that, that, that old style of doing supply chain risk, I think. I saw Tricia asked, uh, trying to be more resilient from our operation systems. Uh, how does the focus of this class differ? The operational systems are absolutely important in this topic. I mean, looking at the ways that your trucks are moving, looking at the ways that uh, you're storing product, where you're storing product, is there resiliency based on inventory that we're holding in reserve? All of those things are critical to this. The, the difference in this course is that, you know, those questions often are focusing on if we have a disruption, how do we handle it? Do we have inventory that's safety stock or held in a certain uh, uh, ways that we can use that to, to handle the disruption? Very critical. This is really different. This is thinking about, you know, not necessarily the reaction. It does cover that but being more proactive. So instead of handle like example, instead of having a surplus inventory that I'm going to hold in you know, various locations in case something does happen, what this course will tell you is what inventory, what items should you be storing in excess because they generate the most profit for you, for your most profitable customers. So instead of holding inventory on all of your portfolio, you may choose to hold inventory for only you know, certain products and even for the products that are not as critical for you to uh, be sure you're servicing key customers. You may also hold inventory for the less productive products or even unprofitable products, but those are products that your great customers are going to require. But you'll hold, instead of having the same level as your most profitable products, you're holding a much lower inventory level because you have a plan that if something happens, you know how you're going to service customers based on segmentation 
associated with their importance to you. This and Tammy touched on this, but then somebody asked how to prior how do you prioritize both proactive and reactive strategies? That's a great question. Tammy, you want to how do you prioritize? Yes, I mean we we definitely have been prioritizing more the proactive because if you can prevent the impact <laughs> of you know profitability loss, then hopefully your reactive wouldn't have to be as much as if you were completely out of the blue, blindsided completely, right? Obviously, though, they're very both very much important to do, though, and be prepared to have some strategies. So that's why we we used to cover mostly on the proactive, but we do cover now both. And that's why it's a lot of content um, and using the same kind of data, too. So that's why it's not that much of an effort to consider both. Uh, but, yeah, if you could, you know, minimize the impact, you're already ahead of your competitors, right, where yeah. they might be blindsided. So um, we kind of lean that way more, but we do cover both. It is very important. And, and in reactive to the point made earlier, you know, if you only have so much inventory and you are reacting to a situation, you may change the way you you, you do customer service as far as deliveries. You may say, hey, we're going to have to go from same day delivery to every three days and be able to handle the inventory that you do have in ways to be able to be more effective in handling the disruption. So there are a lot of things you can do. As Tammy said, we really want to help you become more resilient in a proactive way, but there's also a lot you can do in how you react to the situation based on understanding the customers and the products that you want to protect the most. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add a practical thought process on this is the you know the efforts on the proactive side typically you know you're you are going to then commit time and money to it so it typically lends itself to things that are your high probability high impact so you can think of kind of a overly simplified two by two right things that could really put a hurt on you those are the things that really deserve that um, that proactive action. And, you know, I think on the other end of the spectrum, if you've got things that are low probability, but high impact, then you just want to be really good on your reactive side and your contingency planning. And I, you know, I can give you my example from early in my career when I worked at Frito-Lay and we had folks who were in our supply planning um, teams and their focus was on alternative supply strategies for any situation. And in that, that world, that was a business that ran at relatively high capacity relative to demand. So there were lots of smaller ongoing needs to provide alternative capacity. And you know th they got good at that, right? A plant was running slow and had unexpected demand. They needed a coverage, a shift covered somewhere else. They had an ongoing matrix where they looked at who could cover that week. But those folks were the same people who did the planning for those rare but challenging issues. And in the potato chip business, um, you fried potatoes and the uh, oil was hot. And believe it or not, if you look at that industry, um, fire was a, a real um, challenge. And it didn't happen often, but it might happen once every three or four years, you'd have a fire in a fryer. Um, you typically had good fire systems in place where you didn't burn the plant down, but you might take that line down for a period of time. In that case, that was very difficult to manage proactively beyond much better temperature control and the type, type of things you would put on the production line, but it still happened. Okay. They had extremely disciplined run of show of what would happen when that occurred, even in a particular plant in a particular line. So to me, you know, that's kind of a good way to think about you, you make the proactive steps on the things that are higher probability and high risk, and you just get really good at contingency planning on the reactive side for those things that are harder to predict, but they can really have a big impact if they do occur. Great. Thanks, Chris. I know we're at the top of the hour now. Um, 
I wanted to thank our presenters, Richard, Tammy, Chris, thanks again for taking the time, as well as the uh, guests in our audience. Um, again, if you do think of any questions after you get off this webinar, please feel free to shoot us a note at course at SEL gottech.edu and again the more information details about the course are at our website the the slash scrm will take you to our page our course detail page from there you can click go to the georgia tech professional education site register for the course i believe registration right now closes around um october 9th so please you know as soon as possible if you do want to join us go ahead and get registered um we will be sending out a follow-up email in the next day or two. It'll have a link to a PDF version of the presentation we covered today. And uh, it'll also have a link to a recording of this session. So to all, thank you. We appreciate you. your participation. Thank you.